The difficulty is picking out some important things to say about the upcoming speakers when each of them would be happy with just simply saying a servant of Christ, I'm sure. I know I've left out some things, and I wanted to try to mend my ways a little bit partway through. But John Board has a wife, Brenna, and two daughters, Kaylee and Emily. He graduated from, let's see, there we go. He received biblical in instruction at the Virginia Avenue Church of Christ in Chester, West Virginia, Freed Hartman College, where he got his, his BS degree, Southern Christian University, with an MA in Biblical Studies and Master of Divinity in Christian Ministry, and he's pursuing his PhD at Amherst University. He began working with the Oakwood Road Church of Christ as associate minister with Gene West in 1991, and some other works. He also was a teacher at the West Virginia School of Preaching in various capacities. And he's been part of mission works in uh, Merida, Cancun, Mexico, and throughout the, the World Wide Web. And we are looking forward to hearing him today talking to us about a multitude being fed. Thank you, Van. You indeed could have I didn't really need to say any of those things because I think as I look out, we know uh, most everyone that's here uh, this day, and we're thankful to be here. I can't say uh, how much I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all for the honor it is to be asked to be a part of this lectureship and the opportunity it affords for us to come back to uh, West Virginia, our, our true home. Um, very difficult as you come back through and you start seeing everything, driving over here a number of years to teach and um, some of the routes that we would travel. I, I can't help but think of uh, some of the things even where we see that the uh, paths even to the worship, as the psalmist says, would be those things that would be uh, in your mind. But there are fond memories coming here and being a part of this uh, school and I'm indeed am honored to be able to ask to be a part of this and honored uh, to be able to represent God, and I pray that he is glorified and that honor is brought to him through our study today. It is indeed something that as I look out, see so many, and be hard not to reminisce, so many who are here who have been an encouragement to me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers in Christ, but the preachers that are here, I just looked out and started seeing all of them, so many that have been an influence upon me and uh, appreciation from the bottom of my heart to so many who have been an encouragement in so many different ways. It's a great blessing to uh, have, be able to say that I came from this part of the country, you know. The South, they get pretty proud of their preachers and they talk about their pre But I'll tell you what, the men that are here in this room today as well as many who have either gone on or who are not with us, I'd put them right up there with any of the preachers I've heard from the South as well. They're just great men of God and, and I'm so appreciative of them. So good to see the work that continues in the school. Brother Emmanuel, the first that I was associated with and really the first, I guess, director of the school. And then after that, Brother Denver taking over and uh, being there really with both of them at times as an instructor. And then to hear that Brother Andy was going to be taking that work. And I know that he's doing a great job and, and it's something that is a great work and we need it in our brotherhood. We need young men and older men alike who come and who are prepared to preach the gospel of Christ. And so I thank you for the work of the school. And indeed, I thank you for the choice of the book that we're studying together. This good news message about Jesus Christ in this book, this account of the gospel that seems to have such an evangelistic thrust. And that's truly needed uh, at this time in, in our world. In John 20, 30, and 31, and we'll look at that in a moment just briefly. I don't want to touch on anyone else's topic, so to speak. But yet, we do see that this was a book that the Holy Spirit intended through John to have an evangelistic thrust, to produce faith in Jesus Christ. And the world in which we live today absolutely needs that uh, evangelistic thrust. It needs the good news of Jesus, and it's something that we need to be about and whether we're individuals here gathered as those who love God and his word, uh, men or women who have opportunities in other roles to, to encourage and teach and reach out and through their lives and their examples, or whether they be uh, those who preach or those who are training to preach. What a great opportunity to hear messages 
uh, from this account of the gospel, but it has such an evangelistic thrust. And men who are preparing, who are just beginning, I guess, their journey preparing to be gospel preachers, you truly have a daunting task ahead of you. I believe that those who have gone before and my generation and others, though it's never easy, and please realize it is a great blessing and there's always joys tied to preaching the gospel, uh, and though it's never been easy, I do believe that the times ahead of us are even far more challenging. And so for you men who are preparing to preach, please make certain that you continue to ground yourself here and take the time to learn from the men that you can be taught from so that as you go forth and you face those challenges, you're prepared to face those challenges. And I know the men that are in this area and those who have been preaching will strive to face those challenges and try to be an encouragement and a help to you as you go forth in this world that's changing so many different moral ideas and standards. And indeed, it's really something that we're just maybe having a feeling of or more uh, on the forefront in our country because we know that in other parts of the world they've faced far great challenges as far as spreading the gospel, but we've not seemed to have that quite as bad as other places nor as times past have had in our nation, but I'm afraid those times are ahead of us. And so stay strong and be willing uh, to proclaim the gospel of Christ. You know, most of us probably don't like people interfering in our lives. Preachers who are gathered have probably had that feeling before. And probably everyone to some extent have had people who want to interfere in their lives. They want to sometimes we think stick their nose in. And we don't like often to be told what to do. Now there are some times even as preaching today that I'll hear someone come up to me and they'll say something. I may not want to hear it but it may have been what I needed to hear. And so we need to take all criticism and, and put it in our minds, in our, in our thoughts, and make application as we can. But if we're honest, probably most of us don't like that idea, and especially in the realm or the spiritual realm, we do not like someone demanding things of us. But yet Jesus stands on the pages of Scripture as one who makes those very demands of our life. He is that one that does interfere with our life. Now, that is for our best good and for the best good of all, whether they can ever understand that or not. But nonetheless, we still would say that he interferes. It is, I believe, C.S. Lewis in his uh, Surprise by Joy, his autobiography that referred to Jesus as the transcendental interferer. In other words, he's one who does interfere in our lives. And it's not like we see on the pages of Scripture and some of the other accounts of the gospel uh, messages from Jesus, like perhaps if you might want to consider and, and possibly you're thinking about following me, you might want to do. That's not the language that he uses, is it? Mark, for example, in his account will record Jesus telling us that if anyone would come after him, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Well, when we ask that and we see these ideas and we don't like people interfering and we see that Jesus is one who interferes in our lives, intending good, we might want to ask the question and others that we're trying to reach with the gospel might ask the question as well simply along this lines, and that is, does Jesus have the right to make that demand? Or who is Jesus? that he would make such demands of us. And I believe it is that very answer that John is trying to provide in his account of the gospel for that generation and for generations to come that we might be able to see exactly who it was that Jesus was and why he makes those demands and why we ought to be the type of individuals who would be willing to follow those demands. Because as we look in John 20, 30, and 31 again, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written, thus remain so, uh, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. An evangelistic thrust. An effort to produce faith in Jesus Christ. And it is that very idea and that, if you will, key interpretive 
uh, element, that hermeneutical element that we see here as being maybe the key to the book as some see it. His goal being to produce belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That we see among that which he will use, even based in that text, is another one of the keys that seems to bring this interpretive key to the book and this desire to have others to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ is that the Holy Spirit reveals through John that one of the ways this would be accomplished was through signs. Many other signs truly did Jesus. Now the signs there are not limited to the miracles, to the miraculous. We wouldn't say that, but yet they are included, especially when we look at John's account of the gospel in John 6 and verse 14 in the very text where we are, that they will refer to them as the sign or signs, depending upon your translation, uh, that they saw and that Jesus did. And so along those lines, John is going to then call those signs or those miraculous acts of Jesus to testify that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the one that he claimed to be. And of course, our text this afternoon, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, is just one of the many examples of those miracles that are recorded on the pages of John's account of the gospel that show us who Christ was and the power that he had and the reason that he could uh, interfere in our life, if we want to use that term, that he can make demands of us upon our life. Because we see whether it's from the beginning and we start tracing through that book, as no doubt many of you who have preached have done, and accounting each of the various miracles, you can see that Jesus is demonstrating power over different elements. And it keeps building, does it not, to where he will demonstrate power over death that Mary and Martha didn't understand that he had. Lazarus dies, but there is that uh, answer that we see just how powerful Jesus was. But yet still, that is not catching, and that is not something that we understand the power fully even still, because when he dies and the sadness that exists should not be there because of the hope of the resurrection that will be there. But in this particular text, of course, you're probably aware as well that this is one of those miracles that all four of accounts of the gospel include for us in our reading. What that says, I'm not absolutely certain, but yet it is something that indeed we know God intended for us to know about. Merle C. Tenney, in his work, he highlights four areas, though, that John seems to stress a little bit differently than the other four accounts of the gospel. Matthew 14 is one, of course, Mark chapter 6 and Luke 9, and then our text here, John 6, 1 through 15. But uh, Tenney seems to indicate that there are four areas that are stressed by John that are not necessarily stressed by the other writers. Some of those I see more prominent and more clearly than I do others, but I'm going to list them for you so that you may have uh, that information, not in the lecture in the book, as you probably know if you've looked at it at all. Uh, we will be including some of that material, but there'll be additional information as well. But the four of those four areas stressed by John, number one is the testing of the personal reaction of the disciples in John chapter 6. Uh, we see that definitely with Philip. It's, it's stated as being that. It's to prove him or to test him. And so there's going to be a, a test, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, with Andrew, there is another element, and his reaction is recorded. Whether it is like some think he had some faith, but not as strong a faith as he could have, uh, I'm not going to get into that judgment realm in that way, but we do see him stepping out, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It's not till the latter part of the chapter that we see, of course, Peter's uh, statement there. Where, where else would we go if we would say it? And then, of course, Judas is also included in that as Jesus referring to him as the devil. But, but Tenney will mention those. And then he mentions as well, secondly, Jesus' popularity. This idea that John is the one who records, and if you look at the other accounts that we mentioned, at the close of those, you're not going to see what John records for us. And that is that the people tried to take Jesus by force to make him their king. 
His popularity has risen. We know as we come to the text that people are coming to him and following him because of the miracles that he is performing, because of the deeds that he is working. And so that leads to the third thing, not just the testing of the personal reaction of the disciples, nor secondly, Jesus' popularity, but thirdly, the miracle itself. And I like the way he says this, and you may, you may not, but you feel free to write it down. It is from Tenney. Uh, I added the idea that it is the sign of the sufficiency in the midst of deficiency. It's going to be an example of the sufficiency in the midst of deficiency. And if you know the account, you know what is being stated there. And then, of course, there are educational steps in the faith of at least two of the disciples. And again, Tenney gives these, and, and I give him the credit for this, and as well with some hesitancy of some of the things that he says, we always have to think through, but you can take these and maybe develop some thoughts as well. Because after, of course, we see that Philip is going to be questioned by the Lord, he becomes what Tenney calls that statistical pessimist. In other words, he's the one who suggests that it's going to be about eight months worth of wages of a man. And if you took that amount of money and tried to buy food for those who would be gathered on that occasion, that it would not be enough if everyone took just a little. And I was asking Brent on the way up, what, what's, a, what's some type of snack you get today that we could see if you're hungry it wouldn't really satisfy you and she suggested the portions that you get in those packages of, in an airplane like the pretzels you know man if you're hungry and they give you those pretzels you pretty soon you're waiting for hey can I get some more of those you know that's that's that idea and I think you know if everyone took just a little but we'll see the silliness of, of that uh, concept that even some people try to take today. But we see that this is that statistical pessimist. But then Andrew, he calls the ingenious optimist. That he makes a suggestion, but then he does back off of that because he says, but what is that among so many? In other words, here's this lad with these barley loaves, as John re recalls and as John records and these fish. But what is that among so many? But I think it will be that that I want us to draw some lessons at the close of the lecture to say as well that sometimes when we can just take a little bit of what we have and use it or a little bit of what is available and allow that to be used by God and by Christ, we'll see that maybe great things can be accomplished even as was the case here. And so let's begin putting the text together. I'm certain that with our assembly that is gathered this afternoon, that you're familiar with what we're talking about, this feeding of the multitude, the feeding of the 5,000. Many would say that that we know was just the men, but up to perhaps some 20,000 or some have even suggested more. But let's read just some of this and then we'll go back and, and make some comments and then we'll make some application as well. It says, after these things, and I'm reading from the old American standard of 1901, the old ASV. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they beheld the signs which he did on them that were sick. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jesus therefore, lifting up his eyes, and seeing that a great multitude cometh unto him, saith unto Philip, Whence are we to buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, or test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred shillings worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every man may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these among so many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in a number about five thousand. Jesus therefore took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, Likewise also of the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, 
he said unto his disciples, Gather up the broken pieces which remain over, that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with broken pieces from the five barley loaves which remained over until unto them that had eaten. When therefore the people saw the sign which he did, they said, This is of a truth the prophet that cometh into the world. Jesus therefore, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again into the mountain himself alone. As we begin to look at this and we see the situation as it is developed, Jesus has previously in the account of the gospel been revealed as that one who is the giver of life. Here he's going to be maybe the provider for life or at least the physical needs or the sustainer of life. But it's definitely a picture that Jesus is going to care for those who follow him. As we begin to read and we see after these things, Jesus went away to the other side. Uh, oftentimes commentators will make the connection from Matthew's account that perhaps this was right after the death of John the Baptist, as that follows on the tale right after that particular account and that particular narrative by Matthew as he wrote through inspiration. Others have suggested that as much as six months could have passed. And I think sometimes when we start trying to speculate as to what the reason was that the crowds were gathered, we get ourselves into a little bit of trouble. Because we see verse 2, the text reveals to us what the reason was. A great multitude followed him because they beheld the signs which he did on them that were sick. And so you go back into chapter 5 and other places and we see the things that they were doing and the actions that were being taken. And of course this multitude that we see, we have to, maybe our translations don't convey it as much, but a great multitude, they were continually following him because they just were continuing to behold those signs which he was continuing to do on those that were sick. But at any rate, we see Jesus going up and being seated and then... He's there with his disciples. The Passover feast is at hand, and so the people are going to be journeying on to Jerusalem. And so uh, why not stop off and see this great rabbi, if you will, this great teacher who's doing these wonderful things, and, and see what we can catch from him. I, I think we would, on a journey, be willing, if something was of great interest to us, to also make that time and look along those lines. I always love the fact that Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes. I, I wonder through inspiration, you know, John, and, and how much does the Holy Spirit have in mind here? A reference back to John 4 and verse 35. The idea of uh, lift up your eyes, the fields are white unto harvest. But Jesus is going to look up and he is going to see them coming his way as well. And uh, of course, as he sees this great multitude, he asks Philip, Whence are we to buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him or test him. That word test only used here and then in John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the pericope adultery, the woman taken in adultery, usually is used in a negative connotation, that idea of someone trying to test Jesus, but here it seems to be more of a neutral type of thing. It is just a test that is uh, not necessarily to entrap or to cause him to look bad, but just to see what the reaction is. And we do know, incidentally, that this he did to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Uh, the language employed there in the original suggests that this was a decision that was already made. He already knew that he was going to feed the multitude and that he was going to do this miracle to, to do that. And so that comes across as we read as well. But it, Philip answered him, and here is that statement regarding the idea that, you know, eight months worth of a laborer's wages would not be enough. And when we think of that, we think of the amount that he's saying. That wouldn't even be enough for everybody just to take just a little bit. But we do see, of course, Andrew... Simon Peter's brother. And we'll talk a little bit more about Andrew in a moment, but everything we know about Andrew, whether it be from the beginning of this account of the gospel in John chapter 1 uh, until now as we're reading, if we're just following along and reading in John's account of the gospel, we find that he is a, a, an amazing individual. He is one that when he first found the Lord, what did he do? 
We all know he went and found his brother, Simon Peter. We found the Christ. He is going to make an effort to, uh, to show others Christ. And here, he's the one who's going to suggest something that Jesus will use to show who he is and to show the multitude who he is. They mention that there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. John indicating the barley loaves, those that were usually uh, held or, or kept or those that the poor might have with them. They were also not of very good taste, and so you can see what this meal is going to consist of. And many have suggested those fish were not these large fish that you might think of, but more akin to what we think of as sardines. And so what are these among so many? And we might understand that to be the very case. And so Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. Remember earlier in the text we had read that it was the Passover? Uh, it was Brother Wayne Jackson that I first heard speaking and then later in his writings who highlighted the fact of the minute way in which the scripture often shows itself to be inspired of God. In minute details, Passover, spring of the year, before the grass would be burnt off, if you will, and there's grass in that area, some ideas of, of much grass. And so we see these minute details lining up. If a man was writing that by himself, there's absolutely no way that all of these minute details would come together as perfectly as they are. But yet, that is just one additional argument for inspiration. And so we then see the action that is going to be separated by the disciples, what they do, and Jesus and what he is going to do. We see that Jesus therefore took the loaves, having given thanks, he distributed them, they were set down. Likewise also the fishes, as much as they would, and we know the amount that they started with. And then the text picks up and says, and when they were filled. You almost say, say, say what? You know, if this was something the first time you were reading this and you don't understand who it is, they were filled. And we begin to understand a little bit of what Jesus has done. He has taken these five loaves and these two fishes and he has multiplied them to feed the multitude. And it's not anything that's surprising for those who have studied the word of God and see, of course, the connection between Christ as the creator, as not only we see in Genesis 1, but also then more highlighted and clearly uh, revealed to us in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we're, we're not surprised to find that he is now able to accomplish this. And if there was any question about that, to say, well, they just used those little things and, and somehow everybody just got their belly full, he says, and this is so important for what we're going to talk about in just a, a moment, and that is that he said to the disciples, gather up the broken pieces which remain over that nothing be lost. The Jewish teaching indicated anything that was bigger than the size of an olive was not to be wasted. It was to be gathered up. That's how uh, it precious they saw food as being. But to see that from what they originally had that they're going to now have 12 baskets left over indicates to us what actually happened on that occasion. There was a multiplication of the food far above what the people needed to eat. And then if there was any question, there was all of this left over that we can see. And so it says, when therefore the people saw the sign, and remember John 20, 30, and 31, which he did, many other signs truly did Jesus. Miracles were included in that. This is of a truth, the prophet that cometh into the world. What was the reaction? What was the reaction of the people when they saw what had happened? This is the prophet that had come into the world. Who was this prophet? What were they speaking of? Well, if we go back in the history of the Jews, and we go back in the history of the Hebrew people, to the time of Moses. We know that Moses was a prophet and in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 and following we begin to see things stated about that there is going to be a prophet like unto Moses who would raise up. Now what about this? What is left over? How many fishes were left over? None. What's mentioned that's left over? The bread. Again, take that 
that's just a fact that you can then assimilate into your mind and into your faith. I'm not certain exactly how far I would take it, but I do know that remember what time of year is it? It's the Passover. What is heightened at the time of the Passover? The messianic uh, anticipation. The anticipation of a Messiah to come. Highlighted at Passover. And so what was one of the things that we know from rabbinical teaching that they looked for to be a part of the Messiah? Well, it would be the return of that manna from heaven. The bread from heaven that was prepared and that was given to them by God that would help the people of Israel to be able to be provided for. And so there was this anticipation of such a thing along those lines that they would be looking for uh, this manna from heaven to come. And it's interesting to me at least to note that John is the only of the four accounts who doesn't add the phrase that when Jesus is giving thanks that he looked up to the heavens. John doesn't include that. But looking up to the heavens, that idea again that may anticipate for the reader, especially Matthew's readers, I believe to, he was addressing a Jewish audience, uh, that that could even have that idea again, that, that thought and that eschatological hope that the Jews held that there would be that renewal of that manna from heaven. At least that would be a hint that this is something that we see. But as we go through this and as we look at this, we do know that they thought him to be a prophet. They wanted to make him king, and he's able again to avoid that. It is not the time yet that God has in mind for him to be taken to fulfill uh, the role that God would have him to fulfill. Uh, but as we look at this, for the remaining moments that we have in the lecture, I want us to talk just a little bit about that concept of naturalism. But in, and maybe try to look at it from a balanced perspective. And I hope I'll be able to convey what I mean by that in just a moment. But Geisler has defined the idea of naturalism, and this should be in the lecture, I believe, the idea that they would deny that there is supernatural intervention in the world. Going to deny that there's any supernatural intervention. Well, there are those that we may read after as far as commentators, those who provide a lot of very interesting, maybe illustrative material for sermons, such as William Barclay, but yet we find that oftentimes this philosophy of naturalism creeps into his commentaries. For it's he who often will try to give some type of naturalistic explanation to the miracle that Jesus has just performed. In John chapter 2, when he turns the water to wine, the suggestion is made, well, perhaps there was, you know, wine left over and sediment, and when they added the water and stirred that up, then they had this good wine, this new wine. Well, you know, if, if it was a game show, we'd say, eh, wrong. That isn't the case. We know precisely that those, John had, through inspiration, given us information that negates that. Those were stone water pots used for Jewish purification rites. Nothing but water was ever in them. We come through to this particular miracle, and what does Barclay say about this? Well, again, he'll say, you know what perhaps happened here on this occasion was that what actually took place was that it was more like a sacramental meal like we might think of with the Lord's Supper, where everybody breaks off a little piece and takes something and eats it. That's one suggestion he gives. But from what we've already highlighted, is that even a possibility if we're reading the same text? Absolutely not. It wasn't that just everybody took a little. What are we going to do with the fact that they were all filled, and even more than that, that there were all those basketfuls left over to be collected? And then after that, we see this idea that he'll say, well, or perhaps it was the case that really everybody who went on a journey was going to have some food with them. And so everybody who was on this journey and had this food with them, when they saw the young boy willing to share his food, guess what they were willing to do? They were willing to share their food as well. Again, the answer is really found in the basketfuls that are left over 
the fact that if they're sharing their own food, there isn't a need, as, as it indicates here, Jesus, but the other parallel accounts tell us that the disciples took part in that passing out of the food. There'd be no need for that if everybody's just sharing and, and passing it out. But again, there are those 12 basketfuls that are left over as well. And so when we begin to look at that and, and we say that, what, what are we going to do? We have even people who are writing commentaries who are trying to take away from the miracles of our Lord. Well, sometimes, and, and I've never heard of it happening here, and uh, if it does, maybe they have better judgment than me, but I've heard in other places that whenever someone comes across this and, and they're teaching young people, they'll say something like, those people are just stupid. Well, you know what? We need not to be so unkind. I've seen settings, I've been at lectureships. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that um, Steve Higginbotham took the time to teach me the gospel, I'd still be out there lost, I'm sure, unless someone else came along. But it's not just him that I highlight. When I get emotional, when I stand here, when I think of all the blessings that have been tied to my life, because of being able to preach the gospel, because of just having a relationship with Christ, I'm so thankful to my God who loved us all enough to send his son and our Savior who came and died, was buried, arose, and ascended to be with the Father in heaven so that we can have these relationships that we have. But you know, we were one time at a lectureship, not here and, and not that close to here, uh, when we had invited some people to come and to listen to a message about mechanical instruments and music. And those fellows were from the Christian church. That was my background previously to being taught the truth. And uh, I remember we were seated there and the speaker was up and just making fun of and joking uh, about the use of instruments and teasing and just making all these jokes. And I wrote a note to Steve and I said, boy, I'm glad those people didn't come that we invited. And he said, yeah, me too. And guess what? We stood up, turned around, and guess who was seated on the back row? Those two people we had invited. They'd come in late. And you know what their words were? We're even more convinced now we're right. Why was that? Did they have any argument to substantiate the use of McCann? No. But it was our attitude that was displayed on that occasion. And so we have to always be careful. We have to always be worried about credibility. And we can't, you know, just, oh, well, that's stupid. Well, no, what I think it really does is it highlights the fact that what Jesus did was so amazing, and that's a word we can use. It was so awesome, this miracle that he performed, that it's hard for us in our human minds to grasp. And so maybe there's some other way to explain this, because how could that have happened? It happened because it's the power of God. And so it shows just how amazing the miracles of Jesus were. And we need to not give up that ground. We need to use that ground when we're going and talking to others about the gospel of Christ and explaining that these things, these accounts that we read, Jonah and the large fish, these are actual accounts that happen by the power of God. And we don't want to diminish those. But I think we also can see as we close out the lesson, because our time is almost gone, that maybe as we leave here you all are obviously interested in God's Word you're obviously interested in trying to follow God in your life I hope that all of us are also interested and concerned about souls because that's what God needs us to be concerned about when Isaiah had his salvation provided and there was the message who shall go whom shall I send here am I send me hopefully we have that same desire but a lot of times we're afraid. We're afraid to go and try and talk to others about the gospel of Christ. But I want you to just maybe look at this account here from John chapter 6 and ask yourself, with this small thing that I might be able to provide that Andrew found from that young boy, with this small thing, this small whatever you want to make that, your small bit of knowledge, your small amount of finances that you might feed someone with, and don't just feed them and, and expect them to make the connection between you and God and you and Christ and salvation. Take time to tell them or leave them something so that they know. But on top of that, 
that idea of, you know, maybe it's your ability to say, well, I just have a, I don't have that great of an ability to try and reach people with the gospel. What can God do with that small ability that you do have? I remember Rick Tencher one time, a good friend, and, and this is the first time I heard it said in this way, you know, he said, oftentimes we say, someday I'm going to reach somebody or someone. You know what? That's too vague. Someone and someday never comes. It's not on the calendar. It's not Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, someday, you know, and go on. We have to have real people and have a determined effort, pray for them, and strive to try and reach them with the gospel of Christ and to reach the lost in that way. And besides, when we look at the text that was just before us, we see just like in the text of John 6, 1 through 15, where did the power reside? It resides in Jesus anyways, doesn't it? And so as we take his word, and as he promised Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he'll be with us. I believe for us the application is through his word. And we can take that, and it's powerful. And remember, as Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What can God do with what little we may have for the glorification of his kingdom? I hope you take that at least with you as you leave today and that you utilize it to bring glory and honor to God and his son and the kingdom, the church.